Peace and welcome to the Message to the Black Fam program. Glad that everyone could join me tonight. We should have a very powerful um, show today. I know a few weeks ago uh, we were doing a program and uh, Brother DJ as well. And there was a sister that called in and um, I got a few messages saying, Lady Shabazz, you got to have that sister on your program. And I'm like, you know what? I'm a couple steps ahead of you already. I already have her booked. Y'all just don't know that because that's how I roll. So um, we have a very, very dynamic sister with us today. And this is going to be a very important topic. And I know the title is kind of long, but I really, I was trying to find ways to condense it and I couldn't. So the best that I could do um, is birthing the children that we need for liberation. Um, I think it's, it's very important, um, especially on today, um, so-called election day, I can ca call it selection day, uh, because we already know that whoever wins, um, has already been selected and, and the game has already been planned. Um, but a lot of people are going out today in search of their Messiah, in search of hope, and they're thinking that they can vote them into office. Um, we have definitely drunk the Kool-Aid. Um, I've heard a lot of people today say, you know, our ancestors died for the right to vote. And so it's so horrible if you don't go vote. Well, I mean, our ancestors have died for a lot of things. Our ancestors have died for the rights to um, have sexual relations with demons. They've died over sneakers. They've died over rap battles. I mean, <laughs> black people have died over a lot of things. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily um, something that, you know, some standard that we're held to today once we're intelligent and we know better. Um, we have to, at some point, put our emphasis back on the children um, because today's generation is is pretty bad. Um, you know, we can we can reach out, we do what what we can for them, but really we need to produce a new generation. And so often I hear people say, you know, it'll never be another Khaled, it'll never be another Elijah, it'll nev never be another Marcus Garvey. Said who? Who says that? We forget that we are the factories that produce these great men. These great men didn't come from nothing. It's up to us to produce the next generations of leaders who are going to get us out of the condition we're in. And it's definitely something that can be done. We just have to do it. And I think that it's totally ridiculous to hear somebody say, oh, there'll never be another Kyla. Well, that means you're not trying to produce one. That means you need to get on your job. That means we need to stop having all these babies who are just oops and actually plan it out. Or if you do have an oops baby, okay, well, now you're with, uh, you know, with child. So let's plan it out. Let's strategize. How can we do the best that we can from preconception all the way through, um, you know, until we have this new generation of leaders that we need. Voting is not going to get you there. Marching is not going to get you there. All this coonish stuff that we do because it's popular is not going to get us there. What's going to get us there is liberating the mind of our children so that they can liberate us if we're too afraid to do it ourselves. If we're not going to get it done and leave that legacy for our children, we can at least prepare them and get them one step further so that they can be the ones to liberate us. Um, like I said, if we're not serious enough to do it ourselves. So, I, like I said, I have a very dynamic um, sister with us today. She is a doula um, and just, like I said, just has a lot of good information to say. Um, definitely been looking forward to having her on the program for a while. So I'm not going to waste a lot of time just babbling here because um, I could definitely do it, especially on election day. People have really uh, got on my last nerve. <laughs> so before I go get all up and go, go get all off into that, I should say. Uh, let me bring on our guest. Her name is Priya Morani, and I believe she's here with us. Peace, sis. Are you with us? Peace and love. I am here. Peace and love. Did I pronounce your name correctly? It's Freya Morani. Okay. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I, I know sometimes I have a habit of butchering names, and people usually butcher mine, so I try to make sure that we get it correctly so I don't have other people butchering names along with me. <laughs> Shabazz or Shabazz? Either way. Either way is fine. Either way. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I just basically thank you. Welcome to the program. Um, you had quite a few people who really liked some of the things you were saying when you called in a few weeks ago to some of the programs. Oh, I give thanks for that. I give thanks for the opportunity to share with the family. Yes, ma'am. So, well, first of all, I know that you're a doula. Um, a lot of people may not be familiar with what that is exactly. Can you give us a little background? 
Yes, a doula is a woman who serves. That's a literal translation of it. And in modern days, the way we're functioning now is we are, as doulas, a part of a woman and a family's birth support team. So we work with the family, with the mom primarily, and we work with her from the moment she decides to use a doula, so that could be at any point in her pregnancy or postpartum, and we give her assistance in a lot of different emotional and physical comfort um, and spiritual ways. Um, We are there with her throughout the entire labor. Um, helping her stay focused, helping her stay calm, um, helping her with natural pain relief. Uh, we're there to just basically support her. And then afterwards, when the baby is there, we come to the home and we spend time with the mothers and talk to them about breastfeeding, um, about infant care, about um, avoiding postpartum depression and how to coordinate help um, because, you know, that. 40 days or six weeks after uh, giving birth is a critical time for a woman that she really just doesn't need to do anything at all. She really just needs to be um, eating, sleeping, resting, nursing, and recuperating. So a doula is somebody that just basically supports a woman through that whole process. So we don't catch the babies. The midwives or the OBs catch the babies, but we do coach coach the mommies. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, you heard my little opening spiel here. Um, I think that a lot of people were kind of, <laughs> were kind of a little annoyed on days like today, on Selection Day. Um, where do you think we're going wrong? What can we start doing to make sure that our next generation is a lot more serious and militant-minded and ready for a revolution than we are? Um, should I dive right in to... What I, what I brought today? Sure, sure. We need help. Okay. <laughs> Dive right <Okay>. in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll do just that. Um, first, I would just like to thank the Creator, the Most High, for um, connecting me with my dear sister, Lady Shabazz. Um, it's been a blessing to come to know her and to learn from her and grow with her. Um, I'd like to thank the Creator for giving us this opportunity, everybody that's listening in tonight. Um, and I've, I've, I've prayed that divine wisdom be shared with us such that we increase, that we um, improve our, our situation as black people. I'd also like to thank the ancestors, my ancestors who came together and the lineage that brought me here today. And I'd like to thank everyone else's ancestors for choosing to procreate and bring them forth today and into this divine meeting. So um, with that, I want to get right into um get into uh, what I would, would like to share with the family today and bringing forth the beings that we need for liberation. And um, Sister Lady Chavez, I think you did an excellent um, introduction in, in terms of laying out um, the backdrop in which, you know, um, we bring this topic forth. You did an excellent job. Um, I think it really starts, I hope everyone has maybe like a pen and a pad that they can take down some notes and also uh, take down questions so that we can have a question and answer session um, after I speak um, so that we can build further. But I really think that the first, the first step to creating the uh, generation that we need to bring forth liberation is picking the right mate. Hmm. It's very important. Um, we're coming together, and we know that relationships, sometimes they don't work out necessarily, um, not just intimate uh, Africantic relationships, but any relationships that, that come. You know, they come sometimes for a time, but when, when we procreate with someone, it's the, co-parent, it's the co-parenting that lasts forever. That is a link that once you bring forth a child with someone, um, they're basically, you're basically linked to that person forever. Um, there's a lot of things that we really have to start looking at when we pick a mate that goes beyond um, the butterflies in our stomach and he's so fine or she's so fine or, oh, my God, he read all of so-and-so's books. He's so smart and a lot of superficial things um, just on the surface. 
we really have to start looking at um, things like what is the person's relationship with their family. Um, we know that as black people, we have uh, very colorful backgrounds in terms of how we came to be and, and what our families may look like. But one thing we really have to examine is what is the place of resolve that an individual that we're interested in perhaps having a love relationship with, um, what is their level of resolve in terms of their childhood? Are there unresolved issues? Do they have mother issues? Because that will surface over time. Or do they have father issues? Will that surface over time? It would surface over time if they have issues that they haven't resolved around that. So you'll want to look at that person's um, particular way that they deal with their family background and how they've come to a place of peace and um, healing and, and healthy interaction with their family. Um, we want to, you know, if, if someone opted into calling into the show today, um, of course it's by choice, but you're kind of setting yourself in a different um bracket of people. You're no longer a, com a common Negro. So we have to really give up common Negro ways. Um, and we have to understand that the ancestors chose us. Um, those with many blessings have just as much more responsibility. So, you know, it's kind of like um, a double-edged sh sword, for lack of better words. So, um, one thing I've, I've definitely seen that kind of breaks my heart a little bit is, um, you know, maybe a brother and, uh, you know, he, he wants to live a certain type of way and he's, he's into knowledge of self and um, he, has an, he has an idea of what he would like. Maybe he didn't have the family that he wants, but he has an idea of the family that he would like to have. And then he gets distracted by sister from a girl sister girl from around the way with a fat ass and she looks fine and she has the weave and he gives her a book. I don't know. Sister sold a book or something, some DVDs. <laughs> and then, yeah, she's totally into it. And she reads the book and, um, you know, she starts to go to a few little conscious meetings with him and whatnot, you know, and, and, and he really thinks that, you know, he, he can change her. He has changed her. And then they bring forth the child the relationship doesn't work, end up working out. She has custody of the child, and he's mad because every weekend, the, you know, he sees a kid wearing Nikes and acting like a common Negro and eating McDonald's and don't know who the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is and doesn't know where Africa is or any of the, con you know. But that was a decision that he made because he thought that, you know, he could, change her. So we really have to just look at people like what they are in their natural environment and not be so arrogant to think that we can really change someone. You have to just accept them for where they are. So if they're eating McDonald's and all that kind of stuff when you see them, just know that that may just be the mother of your child or for women, that may just be the father of your child as he is. Yes, ma'am. A really important task that women have is they need to sit, send for the children intentionally, intentionally. Did you have a um, a comment, uh, Sister Lady Shabazz? Oh, no, I say yes, ma'am. That happens all the time. You're very correct in that. Yes, ma'am. So um, this, the idea of sitting for the children um, is something, and I shared this the last time when I had called in as, as a caller on the show, is, um what Miss Sarah Jane uh, Richards did. She's the mother of um, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. And she um, she wanted to have a child that would be something like a Moses for our people. And she had that feeling, and that was the energy in which she uh, brought forth uh, uh, the Honorable uh, Marcus Messiah Garvey. And she was very intentional. She was very intentional about it. She was intentional about um, selecting his father. She was very intentional about how she brought him back. She was very intentional about 
the way she named him. So <clears throat> no more uh, names because they sound cool, you know, and we don't even know the meaning of them because name, names have energy on them. So we really have to start and take a look at, look at your family dynamic and see what is needed. Look around your community and see what is needed and be in communication with the most high, the creator, and really divine on a name for the child because know that that is what the child is going to um, fulfill. And that's why so many of us end up, cha you know, changing our names, um, uh, to you know, because we know that those, the names that our parents gave us weren't necessarily who we are and what we're supposed to be doing on this earth. Um, another topic, uh, another point that I'd like to add is um, we really have to break curses. Um, I'm not trying to be like all like all in the sky or like you know too esoterical or anything like that, but the the fact of the matter is that there have been a lot of curses placed on us as we were brought to this country. Like, as we were robbed from our ancestral land and brought here, there are a lot of, there are a lot of rituals and a lot of different curses that have been placed on us. And it's like, you might look around and see different types of trends in your family that might be going on. Um, everything was very methodical in terms of how... How can a minority obsolete, how can an obsolete minority take the most spiritual people on the planet Earth, the original people of the planet Earth, and subjugate them, even though their numbers are much lower, even though their competence is much lower, even though their intellect is, is uh, inferior to ours? How did they do it? It was a very methodical way, and a lot of it had to do with curses. And a lot of it had to do with um, robbing certain spiritual elements from us that would keep us from keep us from regenerating in a way that's healthy. So taking away the drums, taking away the names, um, forcing us to participate in um, Greco-Roman uh, rituals of going to church and being baptized and all these things and renouncing our African names and adopting their names and all these such things. Also introducing things to us, introducing things to us that were, that are not of us. Um, you know, like alcohol, alcohol, for example. Um, many types of, of, of drugs like heroin and things of that nature. You know, those things are not from the continent of Africa and were used on us as curses, so we really have to look at our family um, and see what types of curses have been placed, what types of cycles are happening that are degenerative, because before you bring forth life, or if you have life that you brought forth in your children, your seeds, and you want to set their course in a different path, then you have to take stock of what is happening, how has it affected you, is it alcoholism, is it drug addiction, is there incest, were you molested, um, was your mother or father verbally abusive to you, um, what other types of things can be very vicious cycles, uh, neglect, lack of nurturing, you know, um, bullying our children, um, all of those are different types of things. Um, even certain diseases like diabetes, you know, that's not hered that's not hereditary, by the way. Um, that's for the most part, black people do not have type one diabetes. That's a that's a European disease for the most part. Uh, we usually end up getting type two diabetes, and that's totally from uh, death style, not lifestyle, but death style. But when those types of things run in your family, like, you have to make a decision that, okay, okay, my mother was alcoholic and my grandmother was alcoholic, but you know what? The alcoholism stops today. Like, no more, like, I will not, I will not take that forward in our family bloodline. I will not take that forward in our family bloodline. And then once you make that decision, having the discipline to stay the course, 
having the discipline. Yeah, my mom never spent time with me because she was too busy working for white people, so I just did whatever I wanted to and ran the streets. Okay, neglect. Decide, I am not going to neglect my children. I'm going to be intricately involved in their life on many levels, in their education, in their rearing, in their health, and all these different things. So these are all decisions, but it really takes you sitting down and taking stock of um, what is going on in your family dynamics, what's in your bloodline that needs to, what types of curses that you need to break. If you need help from a priestess or some type of spiritual guide, I mean, that's always, um, you know, available to you as well. Um, yes. Let's see. And you want to, okay, preconception health. Um, I just want to ask a question that's rhetorical. I want everyone to think about when do you think um, is the age that preconception health becomes important? Um, Lady Shabazz, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you want to share your guests with the listeners? Um, I would actually think from birth, really. Um, I have to agree with you. I have to agree with you. That's exactly what I wanted to share. It starts at birth. Because when a baby girl is born, she has all the ovum or eggs that she will ever have in her life. She has them all. She has them all. And while um, baby boys, you know, men throughout their life, they do regenerate their sperm. However, you know, they get one set of equipment as well. So with our women, um, you know, if, if she's, if the baby girl or, as, during her adolescence or any point is exposed to, like, radiation, uh, toxic food, um, poor air quality, um, emotional abuse or emotional stress or any of that, all of that will affect her fertility later on. Um, I talked to a lot of women in college, like college-aged uh, young women, and, you know, I, I sell pregnancy herbs and, like, fertility herb, for example, and a wound health herb, and, you know, I'll tell them about the herbs. They're like, oh, no, fertility, no way. Like, I'm totally not into that, you know. And I say, well, you know, 10 years from now, do you see yourself, like, where do you see yourself? They're like, oh, yeah, I'm married with two kids. And I'm like, okay, so would you want to try to start taking care of your womb now? You know, you might want to uh, put that burger down. You know, you might want to, to really start thinking because as women, we have to cherish the ovum that we have because we get all that, we get all that we're going to get. They do not regenerate. So we have to take care of, of, our, of our uterus and all of our reproductive health organs, keep our hormones balanced, um, stay fit and flexible um, because all of those things matter. Um, as a doula, I help women through labor. I'm like there. I mean, I've, I've been, I've been, I've been working for 24 hours, for example, like with a mom, with a woman in labor. And one thing I can say is that labor is the hardest. It's like running a marathon, basically, for a woman. So basically, every woman who's had a child can say, "Oh yeah, I ran such and such amount of marathons." Because that's the amount of physical, pure physical work it is to give birth. It takes everything. It takes everything out of a woman to give birth. Um, so, being in shape is very important. is a very important aspect of preconception health. You know, just generally being. You know, generally being healthy. And it always seems like. Um, it doesn't matter what comes out on the TV or the radio or whatever, but, like, it's always, like, what's the answer? Such and such, cancer, whatever. Oh, you know, eat a moderate diet, exercise, and drink plenty of water. That's all, that's the answer for, like, most everything, but, like, that's the answer for this, too. Exercise moderate, you know, exercise regularly, eat a, eat a, eat a balanced, live, plant-based, healthy diet, um, nutrition, um, and drink a lot of water. Um, you know, to add on to that, you know, there are herbs that you can take to increase your fertility and, you know, balance any issues that you may be having. Can you tell us a little uh, bit? 
I'm sorry. Can you tell us a little bit more about maybe some of the herbs and some of what you sell on maybe your website? I don't know if you sell them on your website or. I do. I sell I sell the herbs at um, www.rootmama.org. Um, and then the, the a basic um, blend that's good for women for just general good womb health is um, organic red raspberry, nettle, and dandelion. Um, those herbs are good for women because um, for women, since we, we lose, and, you know, in our childbearing years, up until then, since we lose blood every month, it's it's a challenge for us to keep our iron up. So um, the red, the red, the nettle and the red raspberry, all of those help, and they're also high in vitamin K. So that's just a good general um, blend for any for any woman. But if if you if she wants to like increase her fertility, um, you know, there's like Dong Kwai. There's um, Chaseberry Vitex. Chaseberry Vitex is good for black women because um, it's indigenous to Africa. So um, a lot of times when it comes to, like, balancing our health, a lot of times we just need to look and see what is uh, indigenous to where we come from. For example, I had a cousin who had an allergy to, like, everything you can imagine. And it was, like, impossible for her to find anything. And I said, well... I said, well, you kind of look Ghanaian. Why don't you just follow the Ghanaian diet? <laughs> and she did, and she never had any problems. She could eat whatever she wants so long as it was, like, an indigenous Ghanaian dish or food. So a lot of times that works with modalities that we need to heal ourselves. We have to look and see what's indigenous. Not to say, you know, throw out the dung choir, which is Chinese or whatever, because we have, depending on your blood type, I, like, I have the original blood type, so... We are one of those, you know, we can, since we can do it all, but sometimes for specific types of healing, we want to look at what's indigenous to Africa. So, yeah, there's the wound health, um, hormonal balance, and fertility, herb blends that, I, that are available on my website. But there are other, um, if someone is seeking specific types of healing, they could find a natural path or a doula or a midwife in their community and go and sit and work with them to come up with a plan that will work for them because it might be an, an herb that I don't have or an herb that, you know, they need to get. So um, I kind of feel like I'm all over the place with the preconception health, but I think the main points that I wanted to drive home were um, it starts from birth. Um, physical, our physical health is so important. Um, and if a woman has gotten to the point where maybe she hasn't been taking the best care of herself. Maybe she's a little bit overweight and she's just been kind of chilling out and she decides she meets the Mr. Right, they get married, she wants to have a baby. There are certain things that she's going to want to do before they move forward. And that is um, check her blood pressure. Make sure her blood, your blood, her, her blood pressure is um, good. Make sure her sugar levels are good. Um, she's going to want to start a moderate, not anything too crazy, but just a moderate thing, maybe walking and doing some light weight. Um, she's going to want to make sure she's eating well and start a prenatal vitamin um, immediately. Just go ahead and start the prenatal vitamin as soon as you start getting in the mindset of, yeah, I want to um, procreate. Um, a really important thing for both women and men is that in general, but I'm not going to, I won't just, in the phase, just commit to this, in the phase of getting into the mindset of having a baby or if you're practicing, if you're doing things that could bring forth a baby, you know, we all know what that is, um, you want to let go of the substances. So let go of the marijuana, abstain from smoking weed, abstain from drinking alcohol, abstain from um, eating low vibration foods like fast foods. Uh, fried foods, um, fake foods like canola, uh, soya, um, pro overly processed things. Um, you want to let those go because they affect your reproductive system. They, re they affect your reproductive organs. And men, you have a very important role to play as well um, in starting your child off on the very best foot that you can. So it's not just up to the ladies. 
Um, you need to be healthy as well. Um, being overweight, um, being being overweight, and you know have, having a bunch of toxic um, toxic substances circulating through your body does affect your sperm count. It does affect um, your your sperm's performance and the quality of your sperm. So you have a very important role to play in uh, good preconception health. Um, once conception happens, um, the role of the woman is like really, really vital in terms of incubation, and I call it positive incubation. I don't know if you've ever noticed like some babies come out like super calm, they're relaxed, and they're just chill, and they're just like, you know, whatever, and you know, they're just a lot of that has to do with what kind of emotional state mom was in when she was carrying the baby. Um, or if baby comes out clingy and, like, um, you know, maybe just, I don't know how to explain it. I'm trying to think of how to explain when the children come out. It's just or maybe, like, a little nervous or, like, unstable. They feel like they lack security, those types of things. A lot of that has to do with what kind of state mom was in. Was she, like, from pillar to post, going from here to there, not knowing what's going on with her relationship, not, what's going on with, not knowing where the next meal is going to come from? Like, a lot of that gets passed on. Um, it's to the point where... Like, chemically, you can see the difference in someone's, um, like, blood in terms of, like, adrenaline being racing through your body or anxiety. There's certain hormones that stress produces, and those hormones are very detrimental to, stress hormones are very detrimental to um, pregnancy. And they do affect pregnancy very negatively. And they also affect labor very, very negatively. So... Um, you want it. So if you plan properly, then you're in a position to where you can focus on your pregnancy and focus on just staying healthy. I mean, once a woman gets pregnant, like that really should be her primary, like her primary responsibility and thought. And a lot of that has to do with her support system. So her, her partner is making a way that he's handling the bills, the drama, the stress, neighbors, family, whatever. So it never enters the gate to, that where she has to deal with it, where she where it's a problem for her because he has it at the gate because he's being a protector. So we see how the interplay of ma of of mom and dad and the and the surrounding support system would make that possible, so that. She can pray on the, you know, pray on the child, speak intentions to the child. What do you want them to do? What do you want them to be? What do you expect of them? Go ahead and start putting that energy into the conception because they can already, they can already feel that, and that's the closest that mom and baby will ever be is when baby is cooking in the oven. So why not go ahead and start that process of speaking exactly what you want? Um, I left this point out of my notes, but um, just to add, you want to think about what kind of birth experience you want. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people calling in today, if, they've, if they're planning on having children at some period of time, they may not want a devil to handle their child. Like, they may not want the first person that touched their child to be a devil. Mm -hmm. They may not want the first experience the first person that their child see to be a old white obsolete minority. So if that is the case, it's going to just take special planning and preparation to make that ha happen and probably some research. Um, so some places that you can go to find black birth workers, um, the first one is um, ICTC which is the International Center for Traditional Childbearing. That's where I trained to get my um, doula training. And there, if you go to that website, ictc.org, um, I'm sorry, actually the website is ictcmidwives.org. If you go to that website, you can find your state, and then you could find midwives, and you can find doulas um, on, that, on that page. 
Also, you can go to another website called sistamidwife.com. So S-I-S-T-A-M-I-D-W-I-S-E.com, sistamidwife.com. And, and she's got all kinds of uh, birth professionals on there, OBs, nurses, um, all black, all black professionals, black doulas, black midwives. Um, you want to start looking into doing a home birth. That's the one where you have the most control of who comes and who goes and how, how it all gets down. Um, the next option, you can do a birthing center. Um, and, and in a hospital, it's just going to be, it's just going to be next to impossible because you don't control, like, um, whatever nurse is on shift is the nurse that's on shift. You don't pick your nurse. You don't, you can try to pick your doctor, but if your doctor's on vacation, it's whatever doctor's on call. So the hospital will be the, the option where you have the least amount of control of how your birth experience will be. Um, a, a vitally important point, part of having a birth at home or in a birthing center is your health. You know, you can't be preeclampsic, which means like edema, swelling. You can't um, have high blood pressure or just gestational diabetes. So your health before you get pregnant and, you're, and maintaining a good nutritional balance during your pregnancy will allow you to be able to birth at home or birth in a birthing center and not have to be at risk of a C-section and things of that nature that happen in the hospital. Um, Sister Shabazz, do you um, have any questions before I go on or clarifications I should make? Um, not really. Actually, I'm kind of curious because I've been um, toying with the idea of an unassisted home birth. My only problem is that I know... <laughs> during the birth of my husband's last child. The first child, he was fine. The second child, he actually passed out. So that worries me a little bit. But <laughs> what do you think about unassisted home births? Um, I think they're groovy because mama knows best. Um, now, would I do one? I don't know. Maybe I don't think I would for my first child. Mm -hmm. I think I would for like after I do it. I want a midwife. Me personally, I want a midwife. Yes. That's just me. I want a midwife. But I, I've seen sisters, I've met sisters that, that have done it, and they've been very satisfied. And that's the birth experience that they wanted, and they got it. Um, you know, traditionally, there are many cultures in Africa that women go off into the bush mm -hmm. by themselves, um, and, they, and, they, and they labor and they deliver alone, and they come back with a baby. So it's very, it's very African, and I think that if, if a woman wants that, if she's in good health and she's well-informed and she, and she has her house stocked up with what she needs, um, I think it, it, it's a viable option. Yes, ma'am. And I also like the point that you made. I think it's very important about the role of the father being that protector during the pregnancy because a lot of men, because of the way we've been socialized in this country, they feel like the woman's pregnant, like it's separate, like it, he's not pregnant with her. It's a team right. effort and it's holistic, right. you know, and, and I think that that's so important about being the protector so that she can be at peace. And especially even going to doctor's visits when they're trying to give her injections and all kinds of unnecessary tests and things like that for the man to be there and be strong because his wife, you know, that's a stressful situation. She's scared. She's worried about the health of the baby and all that. And then having to deal with demons sometimes if, if they're going the traditional route, a lot of times they're dealing with intimidating old uh, white people who we right. have a tendency to think they know better than us. It would help so much to have that strong man there to let them know okay this isn't going down yeah so i, I think and that's I a great point I, I thank you for making that point uh sister shabazz because there's two things with that um the first thing is that um with dad with dad with dad what was that I lost my thought okay with 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 dad sometimes he may not know he may not know. Like he may have the best, in like he may have the best intentions, but he may not know what those drugs mean or like what that process entails. And sometimes dad ends up being almost in the as and as in a more vulnerable as as in an equally vulnerable state as mom mm -hmm. because they come in and they're like, oh my god, the blood pressure is, oh my god, your baby's heart rate is this, and we got to cut that baby out right now. Right. Like. 
as a parent, you're thinking, I just want my child to live. I just want my wife to be okay. So he may be like, okay, well, I don't know, you know. So sometimes if mom has a certain way, let's say, for example, mom does not want a C-section. She does not want a C-section, and she wants it to go down X, Y, and Z type of way. Dad is working hard, bringing in resources to the family, has a lot going on, and maybe doesn't have time to become an expert on childbirth in the matter of eight months. Okay. Dad can get a doula, you know. Mm -hmm. Dad can get a doula, or dad can find, help mom find, they can both select together a midwife that is going to meet, you know, that's going to honor their wishes or an OB that's going to honor honor their wishes. So there, there are also other ways that he can um, call in reinforcement to help the plan because the plan so that she can have the experience that she wants, um, that they want as a family, regardless of how that has to look. So if that means having a doula on deck to help implement the birth plan and make sure the birth plan followed as closely as possible, then that's the option for him. Another thing that I was going to say is that you are, you are, you are absolutely right about what kind of state um, mom is in. Um, giving birth and being in labor and being pregnant is one of the, more, the most vulnerable times in a woman's life. Um, and having gone to many hospital births, um, you, women, are bu- women are bullied. Mm-hmm. Women are bullied. Women are forced to have a lot of different procedures that they don't necessarily don't necessarily want. For example, I had a client once who she and I had talked a lot ahead of time, and I and I prepped her as much as I could. I prepped her about how it was going to go down. I told her, and the only way that she could cope with her labor pains was standing up, rocking from side to side. So, she, of course, we have been on the phone a lot, you know, back and forth. And she said, well, I'm going to go ahead and go to the hospital. She was at the hospital standing up and, you know, on the bed, holding the bed, rocking from side to side. And they said, well, you know, we need to monitor your, the baby's heart rate. So they strapped this thing and they're like, well, we can't monitor you unless you're laying down on your back. I'm telling her, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. You don't have to do – this is not jail. Like, you, you know, they treat you like you're in jail, but – you're not in jail. You you make the decision that you want to make. You do not have to lay down on your back. They can come and hold a Doppler to your abdomen and get the baby's heart heart tones. That's not a problem. That just will require them to work harder. But her feeling like being in such a vulnerable position and not really wanting to take a stand, she just went ahead and laid down on her back, and which resulted in a, in a myriad of other interventions that, you know, could have maybe been have been prevented. So it's just to give the listening audience an idea of how it goes down at the hospital and how how being prepared and planning ahead will um, kind of give you the heads up, kind of give you the, you know, be ahead of the game, be ahead of the curve, um, help ensure that, you know, you will be able to have the experience that you want to you wanna have. Um, Another really important thing is cultivating the community around the child. So a lot of that has to do with hand-picking who is going to have access to the child, who is going to be around the child, who will the child be observing. Um, That is, like, absolutely majorly important. And the cool thing about that is that you can do that even before you have children and even before you have a mate. You can already insert yourself into a community and start cultivating a community that you would feel proud of to say, yeah, I can raise a community. I can raise a child in this particular community. This is, this is the place I want to be. Because we all know that the average common Negro village, you know, is no place for a child. Let's just be honest. There's no place for anybody really to be hanging out. So what does that look like? That looks like you picking godparents, if, if that's your I mean, I think that's an important thing, to pick godparents. It's African tradition. Um, these are people that will stand forth with you in, the, in, in front of the community and say that, yes, I accept 
the responsibility that's been placed upon me. Should anything happen to this child, to you, I will raise the child as my own. Um, I will uh, be an example to them and love them for them for the like for their entire life. And that's a huge commitment for the godparent to make to the godchild and to the family. But it's something really important. We don't want as as I don't know if I should say conscious or enlightened, but as sane Africans, we do not want our children going to the default, which may be our parents. Should something happen to us. And that's I hope a, everyone's following me. And that's a very important point that you made just because um, our last scheduled show, which was two weeks ago, we had an emergency broadcast last week, but our last show, we dealt with child sexual abuse. And everybody on that show basically um, was violated by some family member uh, because their uh -huh. parents were not careful who was around their children and who uh, was socializing with their children. So I think that that is very, very important on many levels. Now, I mean, it could be just an improper influence or it could be something a lot worse. Yes, sister. And uh, I, I hate I missed that call, so I hope I can find that download somewhere. Because uh, I, I would like to listen to that show. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'll um, get it to you. Thank you, sister. Yes, thank you. Um, but, yes, that's, that's very important. We have to handpick. So if you talk to a child, they, they don't necessarily have to know that everything is controlled. They might say, oh, my God, everybody that I meet, like Mama mama so-and-so and Baba so-and-so and Imam so-and-so and Pastor so-and-so, you know, they're all great and, like, my friends are all like, but they don't like. They don't know that you've been strategically putting people in their path that you want them to run into. <laughs> so it doesn't matter where they go or how they do it. They're still going to get reinforcement from like what you want them to do, what you want them to say. Like Baba, uh, Baba, uh, so and so may not say it the way you say it, but you know that the message that he's going to give the child is something that you would say. So he may think that he's getting advice from Baba so and so because he doesn't want to talk to his mom about it. His mom wouldn't understand. But you, but you and Baba so and so are in close communication, so you know that the child is still getting the message that you want them to get. Um, you know, family. We really have to reconcile what that means, and we really have to start kind of stepping away from it, you know, like just because people are in our family doesn't mean that they need long periods of, of access to our children. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that they need unsupervised interaction with our children. You know, because they come home with all kinds of mess. They come home with all kinds of, of materialism and um foolishness and playing video games and wanting all Nikes and individualistic and all these types of things. And, you know, a lot of times they'll get it from their little cousins. They'll get it from auntie so-and-so that they were, you know, hanging out with. So the community aspect is so important because we need, we will need each other in order to raise the type of children that we need. So that means homeschool co-ops and, and daycare co-ops and, um, having peers in our children's age group that are like-minded. That is so important. Do you know that children are influenced by their peers more so than their parents? That's so a, a child may talk to their parents, and their parents have a certain accent from wherever, let's say they're from Jamaica or something. But it's really the child gets the accent more so from their friends, from their peer group. And they mimic the behavior behavior of their peer groups. So if you are trying to raise an African-centered child, a child that has knowledge of self, a child that is sane, healthy, and whole, and you send them to play with common Negroes, what do you think will come home to you at night but a common Negro that will undermine everything that you do and say and try to go for they will undermine it because, you know, so-and-so has an Xbox. Why can't I have an Xbox? Why do you want me to play chess? So maybe, you know, your kid doesn't need to be necessarily playing with the kid with the Xbox if you don't want them sitting in front of the Xbox all day. I'm just saying. 
Um, you want to disassociate with any problematic or unsavory adults or people in your life that will be a liability. Um, this would include known and suspected pedophiles. You don't need proof. All you need is a suspicion, and they are game to be uh, completely removed. The child never needs to know that they ever existed. Um, alcoholics, uh, drug addicts, people who abuse verbally um, and physically, also food addicts, violent people, uh, and generally any of those that have a nigga mentality. So um, I do have to say, yeah, on, on more on the horizon, we do have the no N-word policy, so we just have to say Negro or N-word. Okay, no, okay. Sir. Definitely. Uh, in mentality. Um, so I'm not saying that they are themselves um, the N-word, but uh, black people who have chosen to just keep that mentality. Yes, ma'am. Um, we want to not associate with them in any type of a way. Um, and then another thing, I want to save homeschooling maybe for another conversation because we've talked about a lot, but... Um, Another important aspect is just our personal commitment to personal, to, to growth and healing. Because um, just like pregnancy and labor and all the, the ups and downs that comes with that, motherhood and fatherhood is a journey. And, you know, you bump your head, you know, you, you make mistakes. Um, it's going to be what's going to see you through and see the child through to the other side that you're trying to get them to is what is your commitment to your development? You know, what is, what is your level of commitment? Because no matter if you have a strong level, if you have a strong commitment to self-development, to improving, to learning, to growing, to ascending, achieving greater than you had yesterday, um, no matter what happens, no matter what comes your way, you'll always, you'll be on the right track. You know, you can get sidetracked from any one snafu or the other, or, you know, we don't have time or room for depression or self-loathing or any of those types of things. We just don't have time because, you know, it's critical at this point. Uh, we are at war. We do need to raise soldiers. We do need to raise warrior children. So we don't have a lot of time for foolishness and for actually have no time for foolishness and self-loathing and um, defeatism and all of those types of things. So we have to stay committed to doing the best that we can with what we have. And maybe tomorrow what we have will be better than what we had yesterday. So always do our best and create the very the best environment for our children that that we have that we can at any given time. So maybe your child's in school or maybe they're, you know, here or there. But what's important is what is our level of commitment? Do we have a plan to get them into the best environment that we can create? So with that, I will uh, wrap up and um, save homeschooling for another another day. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, we will uh, be going to the phone lines in just a second. The dial-in number is 760-569-7676. Participation code 948656-POUND. Um, so we will go on and, and go to the callers. And I guess in between, um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about some of the values that we want to instill in them so that they don't come up as confused as um, we are. So we'll fit that in in between calls. But I am uh, curious to see uh, what some of the callers may have to say. Um, do you mind if we take a few? Yes, ma'am. That would be wonderful. OK. 8214, you're live. Oh, peace and love. This is Sister Shabazz calling from uh, Dallas, Texas. I want to say um, I have enjoyed both of you wonderful sisters on the line this evening. It has been so insightful and so energized, and uh, I just appreciate what you're doing. It is so wonderful and so right on time. To hear goddesses truly talking about taking charge and putting out the, the vibrational 
spirit that is necessary to call forth, as you both were talking about, calling forth those warriors and those soldiers and those scientists, those who are going to come forth and put new vibration into this atmosphere. So I don't have any questions. You all were fabulous, right on time, and I am honored to have had the opportunity to allow my ears to hear you, beautiful sisters. I sure. Thank you so much. We definitely appreciate your call and definitely um, listen in. We come every other Tuesday night, um, so feel free to listen in anytime. We definitely appreciate that. All right. Okay. And I do want to say that, you know, a lot of times when I'm on the air, I just do this and I really half the time don't even think anybody is listening. Um, and if I did, I'd probably be a lot more nervous than I am. So it's probably a good thing that I think nobody's listening. <laughs> I just act like I'm sitting here talking to one of my friends on the party line or something. Um, so it, it's definitely good to give feedback and let us know what kind of programs you like, um, what you don't like, so that we can kind of um, gauge, you know, what's good. Like last week, um, I did a show on preparedness, which was a last minute thing because of the hurricane. And I didn't get any callers. But then afterwards, I got some people who said, oh, thank you for having that show. I took notes. So, you know, let us know. Definitely not just me, but everybody on War on the Horizon, because when we hear from you, we know what will benefit you and what you want more of. Otherwise, you know, we don't really know. So thank you for calling in. That was um, definitely appreciated. All right. 0766, you're live. Hi, peace and love. This is um, Dawn. And I just, my name is Dawn, and I just chimed in about 20 minutes ago. Um, and I appreciate what I've heard so far, but I have a question uh, about uh, an incompetent cervix. Um, are either one of you familiar with an incompetent cervix, and how can one heal from it? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, well, um, I would want to know about the woman's weight. Um, if she is, uh, she's going to want to get her weight to a healthy level. Um, you know, as African women, we are not, um, we can't go off of a European body mass index because we're built differently. Um, but what, what a healthy weight that looks for her. Um, there are certain yoga moves that you can do. Um, to help strengthen that pelvic floor. Okay. Um, the way the way that particular um, condition um, is it's it's difficult it's difficult to reach those mus muscle groups. Um, she wants to make sure that she does not have any type of uh, trauma to the cervix. Um, that may be through, um, you know, like abortion, something like that can cause uh, incompetent cervix down the line. Um, okay. So we definitely don't want to use abortion as a form of birth birth control. Um, okay. That's because that can dam damage the cervix. Um, there there are herbs that you can take to strengthen that whole unit. One of which is red ras <laughs> one of which is red raspberry. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, um, but it's yeah, it's definitely something um, with that particular condition. The woman will want to look at her womb history to see what could have um, caused that condition to come on her, and you know, work with. The, now, an OB is going to say, well, um, you know, you, well, there is a procedure that you can do that if conception is achieved. Um, before she gets too far along, there's a, a closure that can um, be put on on the um, on the uh, cervix to make sure that it stays closed. Uh, but in order to do that, it's pretty much like an induction that that would happen afterwards. So, right. um, if, 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 if if anyone, if you sister wants to know more about that more in detail, uh, you can call me at 682-587-7668. Okay. And you can, e you can also email me at info 
at rootmama.org just to talk a little bit more in depth about it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. And in case anybody doesn't have a, a pen and paper, as always, um, I do a blog post with, you know, additional information. So all of the sisters' information is um, right on the very first blog. If you go to message to the black fam com, that's message the number two the black fam com. So not black man, but black fam com. And you'll see all of her information there. She has a website. And as always, we want to support uh, black. So you know, if you need your herbs or you know whatever consultation, um, you know, we definitely want to give the sister um, business as much as possible. Um, so that is definitely available for you. All right, five, four, six, nine, you're live. Five, four, six, nine. All right, I guess they are just listening in for the moment. Nine, one, oh, eight, you're live. Nine, one, oh, eight. All right, we will assume that you are listening in. Um, again, the call in number is 760-569-7676. Um, the participation code is 948656-POUND. We are talking about how to give birth to the children who are going to liberate us. And so that is not just... Um, that that's the preconception that's going through the pregnancy and also afterwards so if you have questions about any of those um definitely call in with your questions and comments um before we uh go to the next caller i did want to talk a little bit uh like i said about some of the values that we need to put into our children because i think that that's very much missing i mean even basic things like yeah. not not saying please and thank you and yes ma'am and no ma'am but I mean, the, the, we're failing our children at some point when, um, you know, we're not teaching boys to be protectors. We're teaching boys to traumatize <laughs> the black community instead yeah. of protecting it. Yeah. We're not teaching uh, the little girls to be nurturers. We're teaching them to raise hell, you know, so we're going wrong somewhere. Is there anything that you would like to uh, say about that and what maybe we need to be teaching those children? Yes. Um yeah, I meant, to, I meant to add discipline and consistency because um, working with children, I can tell you that children love to call you out on stuff. Like, I don't know what I, I don't know what I said I wasn't going to eat at one point, but I, I think I said, and I mentioned it in passing, like I, I didn't even make a big deal about it. And then my nephew saw me eating and he, oh, he really loved to call me and was like, oh, I thought you said you didn't eat such and such, oh, but you're eating it now. And I was like, dang it, you know, so children, um, they do what they see and you know they, they they learn by what is done not by what you say so if you say the white man is the devil but you send your child to the devil every day for eight hours they are to, they are underneath the authority of that devil they have to listen to that devil if the devil says sit down they gotta sit down if the devil says you can't go to the bathroom they can't go to the bathroom the devil say you gonna eat this they got to eat that. So that's totally undermining everything that you're saying at home, completely. So when we, a value that we have to instruct in our child is respect for black authority, um, respect for black entrepreneurship, respect for uh, black inventiveness, creativeness, black self-determination, um, black self-sufficiency, black autonomy, and black sovereignty. Everything that we do around, we have to support those concepts with what they see in their everyday life. So the children need to be seeing and interacting with black people that own businesses, black people that produce their own food, black people who instruct you, who, who give them instruction, who give them encouragement. Um, they need to be, they need to have some time that's not so structured down. And, you know, they say, well, you know, what are you going to do? Well, you need to make up something to do. You know, uh, I'm just going to play the video game. No, go outside and come up with a game. You need, we need to um, activate the pineal gland in our children 
so that it doesn't calcify, so that they can invent, because the, the next invention that we need to destroy all the obsolete minority could be waiting in the ch like a child we have like right now. But if they don't have the time to develop their inventiveness and, create, and creativity and everything is structured and we send them off to the devil all day, it really puts us at a disadvantage as a nation. So um, those are some values that we need. We need, we need to really help our children come together as a unit. So we need to help the siblings understand, like, you are to look out for your sister. Sister, you are to look out, young lady, you are to look out for your brother. Uh, we don't have time for this fighting, uh, you know, and, and individualism. If the unity, the unity that, they, that we need as a nation will have to instill that in the home. We'll have to instill that in the home, honoring our, our elders. We can say that, but if the children don't see us going to go pick up our grandmother, going to, you know, deliver food and groceries to someone who may be in a home, if they don't see us honoring our, our elders, then what we say really doesn't matter. So a lot of the values that we want like to instill in our children, we have to have the, dis the discipline to enact those on a daily consistent basis in our lives so that that is the normal for the child. I know when I have children, I want it to be normal for my child to celebrate Kwanzaa. I want it to be normal in, in, in that my child, that we have an altar in our house that honors our ancestors. I want it to be normal for my child to see me dressed in African garb with my hair covered with, you know, my African jewelry and all those things. Like, that will be normal for them. It's not like, well, we're African on the weekends. <laughs> you know, we're African when we go to the cultural events and then we go back to what, you know, obsolete white minority society during the week. Because um, if they have your child for eight hours a day, every day, for 18 years, you know what I'm saying, or, mm -hmm. or however long, 12 years, what do you think will come out at the end of that process? Exactly. And the thing that we have to think about as people who have chosen to call into this show and live this life is that we are exceptions to the rule, right? So like all the people that, you know, we had to suffer through the public uh, shit system and we somehow managed to, to make it out alive and we somehow managed to maintain a sense of Africanness and a sense of saneness. Um, first of all, we have to acknowledge that we are uh, – still repairing ourselves from that traumatic experience mm -hmm. and that we are exceptions to the rule. We are not the norm. Like most people that come out of the shit system are destroyed. That's so true. we cannot assume that we can turn our child over to the shit system and then something marvelous come out. So I agree. And I'm going to go back to the phone line, but I did want to add, I think I talked about this. Um, I forget what program we were doing, but you know, you cannot, a lot of people are like, yeah, my, my child is, uh, has a strong mind and they're not going to be influenced. No, your child does not have a strong mind. That's what childhood is. You're shaping their mind. Their mind is still moldable. Indeed. I mean, Indeed, we don't even have a strong mind half the time. We watch something on a TV show and we go home and do it, practice the same thing subconsciously. So you can't expect a, a seven or eight year old child to be like this master of militancy. Um, like you said, especially when you're not really... Um, following your own advice, you're sending them to the public school system. So, I mean, and I know some people are in a position where they have to. So that means when they come home, you have a whole lot of work to do. You can't sit in front of the TV. That means you have to undo some of whatever's been done during the day. Um, but I just think that that's funny when people say, oh, it doesn't matter. They're strong minded. They know what to do. No, they're not. They're children. They are moldable, and what we want to do, and when I was talking about cultivating the community and things of that nature, is we want to put the we want to put around them and strategically place everything in place so that they are getting molded in the way that we want, so that no matter where they turn, that they're still getting the reinforcement that we want them to get, no matter where they go. Every every step, we're we're we are ahead of them. Yes, ma'am. All right, my brother from the southbound lane. Salam alaikum, brother Lewis. How you doing, brother Lewis? Waalaikum salam, ma'am. How you doing? Oh, I'm fine, sir. 
very much enjoying the show. I don't, I don't really have a comment or a question, but I just wanted to listen and tell you I'm real proud of you, sister. Thank you, thank you. And I hear your little ones in the background, too. We know they're being raised, right? So. <laughs> uh, we're trying, we're trying. They're definitely going. They got revolution <laughs> in the blood, so. Yeah, that's a strong sister that you got on here tonight. We really, we really enjoying what she's talking about, you know? Yes, what y'all are talking about. Yes, sir. I think that you... more of our people will begin to listen to these type shows because they're very uh, inspiring, particularly for those of us who are, are, are brothers, you know, uh, really enjoying it. Just keep up the good work. Thank you so much for calling in. Yes, ma'am. Peace. And uh, that is our brother, Louis Ali. He has a program on um, on Sundays from 5 o'clock Eastern time to 7. And um, his family is really inspirational because his grandfather was actually in the civil rights movement, um, unfortunately was lynched. Um, and so that has had a strong impact on their family and just really a, a lineage of strong, militant manhood. Um, came out of that because the grandfather was was so strong and so black and now um, you know his son is so strong so black and now we have brother Louis Ali carrying on in that same way and we know that his children will be too so that is just um, one example of a very powerful powerful family and we need more of those I sure we do all right 9507 you're live Nine five zero seven. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. How y'all doing tonight? Oh, we're good. We're good. Is this uh, brother reborn African? Yes, ma'am. Y'all doing? Everybody good? Yes, sir. Haven't heard from you for a while. That's great. That's great. I don't have no questions. I'm just listening in because I, actually, I just uh, got on the broadcast, so I don't even know what was what's being spoken about. So I'm just gonna continue to listen in. Okay, well, thank you for calling in. No problem. Peace. 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 All right. Um, and again, the dial-in number is 760-569-7676, participation code 948656-POUND. Um, the topic basically is pretty broad. We're talking about how we can give birth to the children that we need to liberate us. So we're talking about preconception, we're talking about pregnancy, we're talking about raising the children after pregnancy, um, just anything related to that. Because as we see on this National Selection Day, um, our people think that revolution is gonna come through voting. We think that, you know, if we pick the darker of the two, everything is gonna be okay. It doesn't matter that he's promoting homosexuality, it doesn't matter he's promoting genocide in Africa, it doesn't matter that he's supporting our people getting lynched in Delaware, which is a story that War on the Horizon has broke recently, that our brothers are actually getting lynched present day in Delaware um, in the state of Bo Biden, which is Joe Biden's son. Um, we think that, you know, we don't have to deal with that. We don't have to fight. We don't have to do anything. All we have to do is vote for Obama and everything will be okay. Well, we need to change this around. We need children who are actually going to be able to liberate. If we don't have it in us to do it, well, at least maybe the next generation can get a little bit closer to that. So anything related to that is really what we're talking about today. Um, my brother, 0785, you're live. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Uh, give me one second, please. One second. Sure. I was inside a place. I, I was listening, waiting for my time to talk so I could leave out the place and have a, a quiet place to speak. But yes, sir. Lady Kibaz, good day to you, my sister. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Uh, no complaints. Even if I did, I would. Um, I don't know the sister on the phone line. I came on late. Uh, her name is Sister Freya. I'm Sister Freya. How you doing, Sister Freya? How you doing? I'm blessed. Thank you. Um, I've been reading up on a lot of different people, like Brother Amos, uh, strong brother Dr. Amos Wilson, another brother, uh, Dr. Lady Africa, on different on the development, on the techniques, and how to, um, as a, from a man's point, of, from a man's perspective, how to bring along the woman on the on on, on the eating properly, make sure the child is birthed, birthed properly. How to birth a child, you know the whole the whole process. Uh, to you two ladies, my question to you is: before that process begins, 
how does a man who's conscious um, kind of ease along a woman who's not conscious in terms of how to uh, eat properly, how to, how to fast, and how to make sure that she understands that there is a that there is that there is a an entire cycle that goes on before the birth of, before the birth of the child, during the birth of the child, even after. And I got that kind of mentality where like, ain't Jesus Christ, but I know the truth and. I ain't no coon, so we're not gonna be eating this kind of crap. And you know, you yeah. carry my child and so forth. So how do I, how do I bring along a woman into that mentality who's not there yet without being so aggressive and forceful? May I, Sister Shabazz? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Okay. Uh, actually, you know what? Before you do that, the line is getting a little staticky. I'm going to just call right back in. Can everybody just hold for one second so we can make sure everybody can hear? Yes. Okay, one moment. <laughs> accepted this conference is being recorded okay we should be good now okay brother are you still with us i am okay um i was just uh speaking with um sister lady shabazz earlier in the program about what i have observed as one of the one of the worst traps or situations that i've seen brothers get into with this very scenario that you put forth he meets the sister. She's very beautiful. She has, you know, he, he's got butterflies in his stomach. He's really digging her. But in her current state, you know, she is not living in an African, you know, she's not, a, she's, not a, she's not a reborn African. She's just, you know, more and more or less a common Negro. So he gives her a few books and takes her to some lectures and hopes that he will convert her. And maybe she goes natural, maybe she doesn't, maybe she starts putting on African clothes. But one thing you have to understand is that a lot of times women will do that just to get the man. Just because she's feeling him, she'll do really, she'll kind of just go along with whatever he's doing, whatever he's into at the moment. It's not really in her, Africa's not really in her heart. So they bring forth the child, maybe the relationship doesn't work out. She has sole custody of the child. Well, the child is living a common Negro life, except for when he has when he has a child every other weekend. And since she has more access to the child, her and her dysfunctional family, the child ends up being really an enemy to the dad, really an enemy to black people, because the child ends up being a common Negro. So the biggest advice I tell the brothers, and it really applies to sisters too, is that you want to sit back and observe the person and how to move, irregardless of you. It regardless of your influence, are they hitting the gym because they want to? Are they going to the library and getting books because they want to? Are they uh, taking time to, you know, honor themselves and, and walk in an upright way and live a, a, a natural, holistic, healthy, and clean life with the same mind? Or, you know what I'm saying, are they just putting on a uniform to, like, get you? And then uniform off and they're still the same common Negro that they were when you got with them. Not to say that once we get together, we can't help influence each other, like let's reach higher, let's higher. But you want to make sure that before you choose to enter into a love relationship with that woman, that you see the qualities in her that you would want to be a mother to your child, like in and of her, like just like off the bat. You want to see, like, dang, she would make a good mother. Okay, I want to court that woman. But you can't make a hoe into a housewife. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's like yeah. A, that's like a long story short. <laughs> sorry. No, nah, I definitely dig that. You, you can't. I mean, it's been proven from, from, from time of memorial. But my question is, like, what if you see some kind of potential in a woman and you're like, you know, I don't want to judge her because she's not there. I don't want to, you know, come across because I'm conscious, I'm holier than thou. But what if you see something in, in the woman, from a woman's perspective, do you, um, do you feel it necessary or do you think it's right that a man should just keep 
beating on the drums until she comes around or she can No, play. leave her where she's at. Leave her where she's at. Just leave her there. Just leave her where she's at. You know, just put her in touch with some, some sisters that maybe you think she could be a good contact for her so that she can develop some skills. Maybe she can learn how to, you know, uh, take care of herself and, and cook and sew and do, you know, productive things, grow some food or whatever. Introduce her to them, but leave her where she's at. Leave her where she's at. And that's not now. Brother, we're talking about bringing forth the children to liberate us. What we're talking about is like monumental. We can have time for common Negroes that don't want to get on board. You know what I'm saying? They have to make that choice to say, okay, I want to live a sane, clean, and holistic African life. Once they make that choice, then they're viable uh, uh, ground, fertile ground to, to plant a seed. But, you know, you cannot take her out the club and, you know, take her Beyonce CDs away and her weeds and all this, that, and third in hopes that it will stick. You have to leave leave her where she's at. She might be cute. I know you think she's cute. I know you think, you know, I'm sure she's got a great body. But leave her where she's at. I, I The type of top quality woman that I know, oh, my God, brother, I know some top quality African-centered, strong black women who are ready to up our mighty nation. And they're waiting for brothers to step to them. So in Jersey. <laughs> Actually, I know a few in Jersey. So get at me. <laughs> My information is on Sister Shabazz's blog. So get at me. I actually do know <laughs> Sister that's in Jersey. And they are waiting for the brothers to step to them. So you ain't even got still no common, common Negro female. You can just go ahead and get you a, a real deal African woman and, and get ready to rock and roll. Now, let me <laughs> let me ask this question before I have people uh, trying to come by and do drive-bys on my house. Because <laughs> they man getting taken away. Boy, I tell you, first I did the black woman's apology. Now I'm about to get assassinated for this. Um, <laughs> how are you, Okay, so you say you see some things in this woman. So are we talking about like the generic stereotypical sister from the you know that we think of you know that that's shown to us in the media every day are we talking about somebody who is is reasonably you know a decent person and just has a few things to polish up uh, no because when i can I'm, I'm gonna be honest when i say this i don't talk to women i don't i don't have i, I don't know if i don't have but i no longer chase after women because i've noticed over over time in my life that uh, life normally sends me the women who match me. So I don't go out chasing women because normally the women who I, who I feel... Who Brother, I, who can I, I, let me just interject. A true African yeah. woman won't chase you because it's in, the African nat- it's, in the African, it's in the nature of the African woman to wait to be pursued. So if you want a top quality African woman, you're going to have to step to her. I, oh, I, no, I, no, I no, no, no. I didn't say I was love. Women. I don't, I don't, I don't do it though. The whole chasing thing I'm talking about in terms of because I learned that whenever I choose a woman, I chase, I chase for the wrong reason. So I always wait for life mm-hmm. to bring me that woman to say, okay, this is what you chase. Okay. Then I go up and chase her. Yeah, I, I don't feel like a woman should chase a man. That's that's never how we, that's not how it's supposed to be. But these particular women I come across are always women with head with good heads on their shoulder. They um, they're very motherly. They're very um, intellectually driven, they're very, they, they, they have the, the, the qualities that I would like my wife to have. The only thing that they're missing is that they're stuck in this European go-around mentality. And So understand that if you have, if you bring forth a child with that woman, understand that your child will be subject, subject to um, obsolete minority society as their dominating, cultivating molding force. So I think that it's a gamble that you would have to take to plant a seed there. And I think that the stakes for African people are too high to take a gamble on it. So it's just, you know, you have to make that decision. But, you know, that's what I'm bringing forth tonight is that um, the decisions that we make when we bring forth these children are so monumental. Like we, we really, we, we, of course, there's still risk involved. But um, with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and with patience and understanding, we have to remove as much risk and doubt and and uh, liability as possible. We have to. So, you know. Yeah, and I will say from... the best that you can get. 
I would say from personal experience, it's very difficult to undo what the mother does because the yeah. legal system is not in your favor. If you break up, you will have very little to no say. They pretty much um, castrate you as far as your fatherhood. And so whatever, I mean, if she's a basically decent person and just has some things and she's interested in working on it, you know, then I'd say proceed with caution, but maybe, but if she is caught up in the matrix and she does not want to change, she's cool where she's at, um, you know, that that's a very dangerous situation because we have an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old and <laughs> it's very hard to undo uh, what mom does. So be very, very careful. Um, and if that's the case, if it is somebody who's really not wanting to change, um, you know, really not wanting to improve self, then you might uh, you might want to take sister up on her offer. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to take too much time. I, I, I think I knew the answer to my question. I just, I, I just wanted to hear it from a woman's mouth herself. Yes, sir. I can tell they, they, you they that knowing sisters who, um, who are common, you know, people like that are dealing on a common Negro fact uh, basis. Um, I can tell you that you know, a lot of co-parenting is not happening. They do they do whatever whatever they want to do. They do whatever they want to do. And you might say, oh, yeah, she's a good thing. But, like, you might want to say, well, I would like my wife to stay at home with my child and homeschool my child. I would like for my child to breast. I would like for my wife to breastfeed my child. Well, she may be a good person, but she might give your baby formula. You know what I'm saying? She may, you know, she may give them, give them formula from day one day one, so they're already starting off on the wrong foot. They're already not going to have the brain development that they would have if they were breastfed. You know, but she was really pretty and she was really nice. But, you know, you have to think about, well, how would you want your child to be raised? Um, what kind of, what kind of, what kind of nurturing, what type of motherhood would you like? What kind of skills and values would you like the mom? Because the mother is the first teacher. Mother is the first teacher. Mother is the first regulator of everything. When she regulates the blood, she regulates the blood chemistry of the baby. She regulates the heart rate of the baby. She regulates the the fat uh, density of the baby. She regulates everything. She's she's the one who teaches the baby language. She's the one who teaches the baby everything from the start. So. All I'm saying is that it's a huge gamble, and women have to up their game in picking the types of, of men that will be co -parent, good co-parents for the duration of that child's life, and men have to choose uh, not a project, but yeah. a, you know, a, 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 a whole woman, a whole African woman that is ready to make moves. Um, if she's not ready, leave her where she's at. Just leave her there. There's no, there's nothing pretentious about that. There's nothing holier than thou than that. All that is just saying is that I accept the responsibility as an African man. I accept the responsibility of the African woman to choose wisely and bring forth the child that uh, we need as a community. Um, a lot of the things that we're doing today, we are a generation of sacrifice. We do not have the luxury of, you know, doing what we want, or follow your heart, da, da, da. We don't have the luxury of doing, of doing that always. Um, it's a business, it's a business uh, uh, construct, um, the idea of creating a family, um, and it is a generational commitment that we are making. So it's nothing to be taken lightly, in other words. So. Yes, ma'am. I hope that that, yeah. Thank you, sisters. Enough respects. So I appreciate it. I take it to heart. Either she's there or on her personal way there. If not, I don't rock with her. Yes, ma yes thank sir. <laughs> well, thank you for calling in. I appreciate it. I love it when you call. So thank you so much. Enough love. Enough love. Enough love. Peace. Yeah, and if she's on her way, <laughs> don't do anything until she's there. Don't we don't we don't mess know. around until she gets to the destination. <laughs> you right, because she can always hit reverse. <laughs> you right. I know because. 
I know women play these games. I mean, you you wouldn't be be shocked how many women get with a brother with a bow tie. Oh, I'll go to the mosque, blah, blah, blah. And then as soon as they get the ring on the finger, get pregnant, it's a wrap. <laughs> you can forget it. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was never in her heart to begin with. Never, never. We she just, just, she just did it to get, she just did it to get him. Black women want a man and they want a decent man. And we will prey on decent men because they are hard to find. And we will pretend to be whatever we need to be to get a man. So I, I, I agree, you know. All right. Um, <laughs> keeping it real. Um, King David, you're live. Assalamu alaikum, Queen. Assalamu alaikum, salam. Peace, blessings, uh, such for you. Black King's brother, Aslam Alaikum. Alaikum, man. I just not only have a, a comment, I would have a question. It's a, you know, just a comment. I'm just in, enjoying the show, and we can just clone you sisters and put one of you in every city. We'd be in a whole hell of a lot better shape than we're in now. You sisters are really on point. You're, you're, you're just you're just dropping it. You're just dropping the fire. You want me to make you some cookies, don't you? That's my husband, but Sister yes, Free. <laughs> Can you make him some? Can you ship me some? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we get these kind of words. It's a plot. But yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's just good to hear, you know, a strong sister, you know, in the community, you know, just just working behind the scenes. You know, uh, you got all these Negroes, you know, on, on TV and, you know, and all this crap, you know, and all these uh, interviews and just putting yourself out front, really not doing anything in the community. It's just good to hear a sister, you know, in the community, you know, doing what's right, doing what's good for black people. And I just want to say my hat goes off to you, sister. Yes, Thank sir. You, man, what you're doing. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So I'm like a sister. Like I'm sorry. I'm like I'm sorry. All right. I think we have a celebrity in the house. My brother. <laughs> How are you? I'm, I'm just listening. I'm just listening. All right. Well, you can keep on listening. Be that way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Peace. All right. Peace. That is our beloved brother, the irritated genie, acting like he ain't got nothing to say. I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it either. <laughs> <laughs> that brother got something to say about everything. <laughs> That's all right. Um, let's see. 8257, you're live. Uh, actually, just came in late, sister. Not aware of the topic, so just listening right now. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for calling in. Always. All right. All right, so again, the call in number 760-569-7676, participation code 948656-POUND. Um, again, we are talking about the very broad topic of how to give birth to children um, that we need for liberation, because it seems like our generation is not going to do it. We are um, refusing to act like we know, and I think we most of us do know what we need to do to liberate ourselves, but... For whatever reason, we're not really doing it, so maybe the next generation can do it for us. You know, what do we need to instill in these children um, to make them liberators? You know, because it, it, like I said in the introduction, it's silly to say, oh, there'll never be another Khalid, there'll never be another Marcus Garvey, there'll never be another Elijah Muhammad, there'll never be another Nanny or Nzinga. No, those people didn't just happen. Those people were created. We are the factories who produce our liberators, all those babies that we abort because it's not convenient, um, all these children that we give birth to and then stick in Head Start because we haven't planned things out correctly and we basically are throwing them away to the system to the point where by third grade, the boys have terrible self-esteem. They're basically on a one-way track to special education and then jail. We're wasting our most valuable resource. So that's what we're talking about today. What do we need to do to make sure that our children come forth with a more revolutionary spirit? They don't need to sit down in front of the television for hours a day. Um, you know, you give them it. a book. You teach it. I mean, give them a book to read. I mean, we... <laughs> There's no, I, I look back to when I was young and back then I think uh, Nintendo was the bomb. And then if you had Super Nintendo, then you was real fly. You know what I'm saying? But I never had more cartridges than I had books. 
I had shelves and shelves of books, and I think I had maybe Tetris and Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt for cartridges. You know, I read. We don't do that anymore. We don't go to the park anymore. We don't play in the dirt anymore. You know, it, it's ridiculous. I think that um, if people want to really look into parenthood, if you if you do study the life of the Honorable Marcus Josiah Garvey, look at how he was reared. His father read father um you know introduced him to his library at a very at a very young age his mother uh picked a very good godfather very good godparents for uh brother garvey um and they had a hand in rearing him um his uncles he had apprenticeships from a very young age he was taught entrepreneurship and do for self he was taught not to rely on anybody uh, when he dealt with racism, his, his his father had an answer to it because his father wasn't dependent on white people. So his father's answer was not, well, you better be good to these white people because you need a job. No, his father was, yes, they are devil and do for self. Um, so if we could just study his life, um, it will really inform a lot of the decisions that we can make as parents and as community members. Um, because uh, since his Lake Shabazz, you don't have children, correct? Uh, no, ma'am. I don't. I don't. I don't have children either. But I feel a great sense of responsibility for the children of the nation. Um, I don't have children, but I already. I already feel like a mother. I already feel like a mother, and I do mother other. I do mother other people's children, and I take a personal responsibility to make sure that they are raised and reared in a way that is ha happy, healthy, and whole, so that they can have a better childhood than what I had. That's my that's that's really one of my uh, sole missions is to invest in the children. Now, how do you think that um, we combat? And I know you know we we're talking about people starting from scratch as far as building the community and things like that. Not everybody has taken the time to do that. Some people may already have a child that's you know three or four years old, and so now they're like, okay, well, what can I do? I think individualism is um, definitely a foreign concept, but something that we have embraced as our own and embraced as basically the superior way to be. Um, what can we do with the children that we already have to kind of combat some of that individualism in our children, or even if we haven't had children yet, to keep them away from it? Um, to uh, combat individualism, um, well, an important piece is going to be creating the community. So the children are going to need to see you interacting in the community and family in a way that is conducive to, like, collective responsibility, um, to collectivism, period. So they need to, first of all, they need to understand what their responsibility is to the community. So if a child is seven or some, I'm just throwing out an arbitrary age, you may say, okay, well, um, Jamal, you are responsible for uh, putting all the chairs out for the Kwanzaa Festival and, like, we're really depending on you to get it right because everybody has a part to play and really help them see the bigger picture of what you're doing to contribute to the collective benefit of all of us. Or um, uh, uh, baby and Zinga, you know, you're 10 years old. We really need you to look out for uh, this baby because she's looking up to you to see how to move and act. So it's very important that, you know, you act X, Y, and Z. Also, when we teach entrepreneurship to our children, all of that money should not go on candy and little stupid foolish shit. Um, they have a lemonade stand. They need to understand, okay, well, I'm taking 10% out of your lemonade stand um, for your education tomorrow, and 30% we're going to, or whatever percentage, we're going to contribute to the collective because we have to support black institutions. So let's decide what you want to invest in. And then maybe you sit down with your children at the table and you lay out, okay, here's War on the Horizon. Here's what War on the Horizon is doing. Here is Root Mama Maternal Care. This is what they're doing, da 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 So what, who are we going to invest in this month? 
And the baby says, oh, well, I don't know. I really like the programs on War on the Horizon. Let's invest in them. Okay, so then they send their thought, have them do it. Go get the envelope, um, write down the address on the envelope, and put your money, you know, put your money order in there or whatever, or go online and click on the PayPal donate. Because if we, we should tell them, well, you need to support black businesses. We need to support black community, which is what collectivism. But if they don't see it happening, if they're not a part of the process, it's foreign to them. It's just rhetoric. It's not going to really teach them anything. And it's one thing to give your give your money to them to put in the donation plate, but it's another thing to make them earn the money through entrepreneurship and then give the money away because it's an African concept. We give with one hand and we receive with the other. We have to we have to let them experience that so that they can feel how does it feel to give resources to another black person, but not any black person, to a black person or institution that is um, leading towards liberation, that's sustaining us, that is um, benefiting and nurturing the community. So those are just some, a few little scenarios of how we can uh, work with the children that we do have to combat individu individualism. And, you know, if, if they don't want to share or something like that, they have to feel what it, they have to really feel what it's, how it's See how it feels to have something taken away from them, from demonstrating behavior that would be maybe down the line treasonous or down the line very detrimental to black collectivism. Um, I think that children have a little bit too, like I see them with cell phones and, oh, she doesn't have to give up because that's, you know, that's hers. They do need a private space and space to themselves and things of that nature. But um, the idea of sharing, of giving, of supporting black and those types of things, they need to be instilled in the child from a very young age. And they need to walk through the process um, and, and really have an active role in it and not just be told, um, well, don't be individualistic. Yes, ma'am. I think that's very, very good advice. And I will say, I'm not one to speak for Irritated Genie, but I'm pretty sure War on the Horizon would love to get some of your children's money. So <laughs> send it in. But um, I think another thing that I think would probably be important as well um, is teaching them real leadership and standing up um, for right and wrong and standing up for black. Because one thing that irks me, and I've seen it so much lately, um, is that our youth, if they see something going on, say they're in a Korean store and the Korean starts, thinks somebody stole something and they'll like uh, start grabbing them and ripping their clothes off. I've seen some crazy stuff. And there'll be 10 black people and three Koreans. And instead of those 10 black people saving their brother, they'll just sit there with cell phones and videotape the humiliation. They're recording. They're recording. Yeah. They're recording their own humiliation instead of stepping in and doing something. So I think that that's something else, because that irks me so bad that we really need to train our children to do is to stick together and, and black first. Even if they did steal something, you don't sit there and let anybody of another ethnicity humiliate somebody uh, that looks like you. You don't do that. You, When you see something going on, some kind of injustice, you don't just sit there and film it. Get involved. We have to teach that from a young age because I think that's why so many of us don't care about what's happening now until it affects our own family, until we need help. And when we need help, then it's, oh, you know, black people help me, we're family. But if it's somebody else, if it's our neighbor, don't matter. It don't matter. Mm -hmm. That's sickening to me. Um, a lot of that has to do with black reverence, revering that which is black. Mm -hmm. That's a whole meditation. That should be it. That should be um, part of that of uh, spirituality in daily life. The reverence is the reverence of black. Yes, ma'am. All right. Looks like we have one last caller. Um, eight seven nine four. You're live. Eight seven nine four. All right. Uh, they just called in, so maybe they're just listening in, trying to get a grasp on what the program should be. 
All right. Uh, well, we have a few minutes left in the program, so we can start uh, winding down. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about today that we didn't get a chance to talk about yet? Anything that you think we missed? I know. I would love the listeners to perhaps, you know, just uh, either take some extra time with their own children or children around them um, to just, you know, spend some time to be a positive influence in the child's life. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I think that there's so many lessons that we need to teach that we're not teaching. Um, like you said, I mean, we could go on for days and days talking about that. But I'm really glad that we were able to do this show um, today because it is important. Um, you know, a lot of us already have children and we're going to do the best that we can with those children. Um, but for the next children, uh, next group of children that we may have, to take the time, you know, ahead of time to really think about it. And even if we do have an accidental pregnancy, if we've already put that thought into it, then we're not so far behind. If you've already thought about what will happen with your next child, then even if that child comes and may not be planned, um, you know, you still have a plan in place and you can jump right in and really produce quality children because we cannot... We're never going to get liberated like this. You know, um, I've heard people say so often, you know, there's bl uh, black people and then there's N-words. Well, as long as that's going on, you can forget it. We all need to be black, unapologetically black. Um, we can't continue. That's true, and that may, mean small, that may mean smaller numbers. The amount of investment in terms of in, in the children that need, that need to be made. Mm -hmm. Um you know, because, I mean, if we look at obsolete minor minority society, I mean, they're in the major minority, but they're really running shit. So it's really not about numbers. It's about the skill and quality of the individual person. So imagine if we could have, you know, what if we had five Garbies? Mm -hmm. I think we'd be free, like, tomorrow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is this is not a numbers game. This is not like, oh, go forth, nation build kids that is not what this is about that is not what this conversation is about that is not nation building nation building is exercising discipline knowledge wisdom and understanding to implement some of the things that we discussed tonight even at the personal sacrifice that we like some of these things require personal sacrifice period point blank there ain't no way around it. It is not going to be easy. It's not going to be a walk in the park. This is not fun and games. This is not loving hip hop. This is not follow your dreams, fall in love with who you want to, and all this kind of crap. That's not what this is. This is war. This is um, this is the stakes are high, and we don't have a lot of room for uh, feel good moments. This is about making the tough decisions that we have to decide our way out of subjugation and bondage and, um, you know, letting this devil run this planet. And we really have to restore order um, to the planet. And what that means is both people back on top, black people back in charge of the resources and um, stewards of this earth. So we really, need to, we really need to invest, make a commitment for seven generations out. Everything that we're doing now, we have to look at the seven generations that it took to get us here, and we have to be committed seven generations after us. So as a generation of sacrifice, like, that's what we have to do. And I've made that, I've made that commitment. I have made a commitment for seven generations of my bloodline. So the things that I do and I'm setting up now, I'm thinking like, what future? Yes, ma'am. Well, as I said, um, we do have your contact information on Message to the Black Fam, but if you'd like to give out your contact information again for anybody who might want a consultation um, for pregnancy, preconception, might want to buy herbs or any other services that you provide, you're more than welcome to give that information again. Thank you, sister. Yes, um, that can be reached um, on online where you can find out more about Root Mama Maternal Care. Root Mama is a company that I run. I'm a doula service. 
Um, I help pregnant women. I help women with womb health, is- womb health issues. I do preconception and fertility consultations. Um, I also am a breastfeeding educator, and um, I also provide postpartum support. So all of, a little bit more about the company as well as my contact information can be found online at www.rootmama.org. It's R-O-O-T-M-A-M-A dot O-R-G. Um, I also have a free class ser- series that's starting up this Saturday. Um, it's called Mama's Meditation, and it is a guided relaxation for pregnant women. Um, and I will be doing that class every Saturday at 9.30 a.m. Central Time. So if you have a Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash rootmama, and click on events, all of the information is there for med- uh, Meditation Mamas. So if you are pregnant or if you know someone who is pregnant um, and you want to, please send them the class link so that they can get in and get some relaxation tips um, so that they can have, you know, a more stress-free pregnancy. Yes, ma'am. Well, I want to thank you so much for the show. Um, I know that everybody enjoyed it, um, got a lot of information and a lot of ideas, and we can use this to build on, you know, getting even more ideas for the future. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, sister. I so enjoyed it. Yes, ma'am. I'll be talking to you very soon. Peace. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining in. If you want to hold tight, we have Brother DJ and uh, Commit coming up um, in just a few minutes. Their topic is going to be, let's see, disaster capitalism and the corporate state. Um, They're going to have a guest on, Brother Wali from Harambi Radio. Um, So be sure to tune in for that. Um, And I'm going to take us out with a little united front. You know, we cannot get enough of the African liberation music. Um, You know, we're going to listen to a song called College Back. And it's basically uh, just saying that we need some of these ancestors back. And we know how are we going to get them back? We're going to produce them. We are the factories. We are going to make our next generation of liberators, hopefully starting now. Well, I would say now, no. Don't start now. Wait till after the cipher. And then let's start getting on creating these new children for our liberation. Peace.
All you dogs gotta vanish. If Tyler was alive, I yeah. He wouldn't let the nonsense slide. I shake, why should I? I think it's about time to conduct the seance and bring the channel back to life. Comics back, on uh, comics back, on uh, and singers back, on uh, and singers back, on uh, a mill cost back, on uh, a mill cost back, on uh, tell Jones back, on uh, tell Jones back, on. Uh, I think I'm cut yo, my room straight cut throat. Giving crackers hell, gorilla warfare in a Jamaican jungle. Bust ass with cut glass and machetes bending in with the trees. These devils ain't ready. I think I'm cuffing, uprising in Burbies. 3,000 deep showing them no mercy. I think I'm sick, cutting throats on the Amistad. I think I'm sent away, yo, I'm a Zulu shocker, I'm a ride. I think I'm bombarder, keeping the tradition. Going, putting pressure on Europeans, watching their blood flowing. I think I'm in the lick, king of kings, a line of soldiers. Side to side with my queen, running crackers out of Ethiopia. D. Don Kimanti, Thomas Sankara, Gaspar in Mexico, African warrior. I think I'm Chancellor Williams, trying to get your mind right. Freedom of death, I risk my eyesight in my life. Yeah.